are honored to have her visit in this current year eight of this summer, this semester. And, uh, but she's been working for the uh, NGO called the uh, Article 76, uh, which uh, was a uh, part of the uh, um, International Student Group of International Campaign uh, to abolish the Great Web of ITA. Yeah, if you remember, they won the end of these fights. And uh, so, um, well, I'm very sure that you get to learn a lot from her. I mean, the sort of thing that we post-conductors kind of teach you, sort of thing. And uh, I think I should say a few words about the activities of the Diplomania. And the start of this is a sad event organized by the Diplomania. And the Diplomania is a uh, well, yes, yes, uh, student's activity. Uh, aimed at the uh, well. Ah, well, give me the understanding about global affairs to not only to be a JGU student, but to non JGU students as well. Um, since this is a sort of a rare opportunity for us, including myself, to listen to the view of the practitioner, I very much hope that you will touch on that. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, can you see me? I'm a little bit short. So uh, yeah, thanks for having me. So um, as Hannah said, uh, I am currently visiting JSIA for this semester, but normally I work for a small NGO in London, which is called Article 36. Um, so about us, basically, so we're a UK-based NGO. We're very small with uh, four colleagues in the UK and uh, one in Geneva in Switzerland who works uh, with our UN sort of uh, work there. Uh, basically, uh, what we're aiming to do is to help strengthen international standards to prevent and uh, address harm from different weapon systems. Uh, we work to promote the greater scrutiny over the development and use of different weapons. And um, our main sort of format of work is to work in global civil society coalitions with uh, other organizations and also in partnership with governments to uh, promote the development of new standards, so for new treaties, for new political commitments uh, at the international level, and with the major intention here of better protecting communities and working from a sort of humanitarian perspective. Okay, so we sort of see, see ourselves, uh, we see ourselves as a part of this kind of broad community of practice, which calls itself the uh, humanitarian disarmament community. Uh, so humanitarian disarmament uh, refers to this sort of conscious effort by a certain section of global civil society in partnership uh, with a, quite a range of countries to bring a focus in international discussions about weapons issues onto what do these technologies actually do to people and places in the context of armed conflicts. Um, moving the focus away from what are the strategic or military values of, of certain weapons uh, and onto um, the humanitarian facts about them in order to kind of change conversations and uh, change the law towards uh, greater restrictions um, in the use of force and uh, more so humanitarian objectives there. So my talk today for you is going to be about this uh, global humanitarian initiative on nuclear weapons and the new treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, uh, which is a recent development in the global multilateral disarmament landscape, and also to talk about um, our role at Article 36 and uh, ICANN's role in this development. So globally, you know, civil society has been engaged on the question of nuclear disarmament for, for decades, right? I mean, since these technologies were invented, uh, there's been a sort of very strong anti-nuclear weapons movement, particularly in kind of Europe and North America that's, that's had some impacts and gains, and um, NGOs and academics have contributed quite a lot to these international legal forums which deal with nuclear weapons issues. Um, but I'm gonna talk about this one sort of specific case. Uh, so this new treaty, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, uh, was negotiated at the UN in New York in 2017, uh, in July, and adopted by 122 states. Um, and this is a picture of us from ICANN uh, celebrating because uh, we're really pleased at the moment of adoption. Uh, so this new treaty, it creates an international legal framework uh, for the elimination of nuclear weapons. 
and it's sort of a major new development being that it's the first international treaty that's been concluded uh, towards this purpose of nuclear disarmament in a couple of decades and in the context of the sort of very stalled uh, multilateral environment and also you know a dangerous one with certain developments around nuclear tensions at the moment. Um, I can, as was said, and I'll probably mention this again a few times, was given the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017 for its work uh, towards this treaty and um, to focus, you know, to bring this focus on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. Uh, this is a picture of the International Steering Group of ICANN uh, in Oslo in Norway, um, getting our selfies with the Peace Prize. So the themes of this lecture are going to be to look at what was the rationale and uh, what's the significance of this new development of this treaty on the multilateral disarmament landscape for, with respect to nuclear weapons? Um, how has civil society helped countries work towards this? Uh, and also, like, what, what happens next? Uh, so, this new treaty is uh, rooted in an effort to try and change the international discourse on nuclear weapons. So to try and focus on the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons, uh, what they actually do, and the real world sort of risks of their use at the moment. So I mentioned that this is kind of an approach that us in our organization and in our community take um, in relation to quite a few different problems. Um, this kind of originates uh, in a movement in the 1990s uh, for a global campaign to uh, prohibit anti-personnel landmines uh, based on the sort of humanitarian crisis that they were causing around the world at, at that time. Um, about 10 years later, there was a similar campaign for the prohibition of uh, cluster munitions, which resulted in another prohibition treaty. Um, uh, we're part of these coalitions and we also uh, work on other issues such as um, armed drones and uh, increasing autonomy in weapon systems, this, this issue of uh, killer robots. Uh, so basically, you know, this community that, that works with this approach of trying to focus on uh, the humanitarian impact of weapons in order to generate new restrictive laws and norms around them, uh, was thinking after the cluster munitions uh, campaign was concluded, can we apply this kind of logic to the nuclear weapons issue? And would this enable us to make any progress on this um, in the context of not much having happened to get near the elimination of these weapons of mass destruction in the last kind of 70 years, right? So this, this is a picture um, showing the aftermath of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima in Japan in uh, 1945. Uh, nuclear weapons have not been used in war since then, though Countries have had extensive testing programs uh, which continue to sort of cause health and environmental effects in countries around the world to this day, um, in the Pacific, in the former Soviet Union, and uh, also in other places. Around nine countries, well, exactly nine countries, have now around 15,000 uh, nuclear weapons uh, in, in the world, which is enough to render the planet totally uninhabitable if they were all used. Uh, and a lot of the kind of justification for the retention of nuclear weapons has been um, on the basis of the idea of nuclear deterrence and strategic stability, which I'm sure you're uh, familiar with. There's quite a few treaties that exist, you know, on nuclear weapons internationally already. So this non-proliferation treaty, the comprehensive test ban treaty, which is not yet in force, um, measures on nuclear terrorism and stuff like that. Um, and there's a kind of general acknowledgement from all states that a world free of nuclear weapons is something desirable, but it's generally put in the future as some utopian goal that probably couldn't happen, you know, in our lifetime or maybe someone else's lifetime or maybe like, you know, ever. So there hasn't been very much, much progress. So the fact that, you know, the nuclear armed states at the moment, they basically don't have very much incentive for disarmament because nuclear weapons are still seen as you know, valuable and useful for these sort of strategic um, purposes, right? They occupy this position in the world of being seen as you know, conferring power to states, defensive or offensive, political, military, uh, whatever. So ICANN's strategy as a campaign, as a result, in partnership with the governments uh, leading this humanitarian uh, initiative, which included governments um, like Austria, Brazil, Ireland, uh, Mexico, South Africa, who are often kind of strong on these humanitarian disarmament issues. Um, the idea was that, you know, this, this initiative uh, 
was to try and shift the conversation amongst the majority of the world states onto these facts about humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons, if they're ever used, and also the evidence about the risks that these weapons actually pose in our world today. And to base this on kind of knowledge about the <coughs> historical examples of uh, nuclear escalation and near misses, of which there's, there's quite a lot, for example, in the Cold War between the US and Russia, where human and computer errors brought us like very close to an accidental nuclear war sort of multiple times. Um, there's also uh, examples in different regions of um, where countries through, you know, sort of miscommunication internally or between each other have come closer to the use of nuclear weapons than they might have ever intended. Um, so to say, you know, look at these facts and look at the evidence as opposed to uh, just what countries are saying about their strategic value and, uh, you know, the theoretical idea that these aren't ever usable uh, weapons and um, to look at this, you know, sort of role of deterrence. So the strategy is to try and shift the discussion away from the question of are nuclear weapons something that is useful to someone, uh, concentrating on the interests of states, and onto whether they are legitimate at all as a technology for anybody. And to challenge this idea that nuclear weapons can be a legitimate part of sort of any state's uh, nuclear arsenal because of these horrific consequences and because of the real possibilities of nuclear use um, or accident that exist. Um, and the, the thinking here as well is that if you focus on these facts, there's only really one kind of legally coherent and uh, morally permissible way forward, uh, which is the categorical prohibition of nuclear weapons in international law for all states, which would fill the kind of international legal gap that currently you know, existed, uh, where nuclear weapons are prohibited for most, uh, but you know, not, not quite for everyone categorically, and there's no framework at the moment for, for elimination. Uh, focusing on, on these humanitarian consequences could help encourage this you know, re-evaluation of the strategic and military value ascribed to nuclear weapons and look at, you know, might these be outweighed by these overriding risks uh, which are inherent in these technologies and generate some multilateral context of more pressure on the nuclear armed states uh, over their kind of dangerous arsenals that they have. Uh, so, in terms of the process to bring about this sort of changing of the discourse on nuclear weapons in, in the multilateral space, so, you know, specifically between states in these international forums where they talk about these things, uh, in the General Assembly, in the Non-Proliferation Treaty meetings, uh, things like that. Uh, starting in around 2009, um, an effort began amongst states and civil society and also international organizations, including the, the Red Cross movement, uh, to try and insert language about humanitarian concerns into international conferences and documents discussing these issues. So talking about the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. Um, states also uh, convened what became known as the Humanitarian Initiative uh, to examine uh, these evidences. Uh, evidence. So um, there were conferences held by the governments of Norway, Mexico and Austria in 2013 and 2014, uh, which brought in evidence from you know, nuclear scientists, health professionals, also um, importantly survivors of the atomic bombings of Japan and also of nuclear testing, um, to kind of you know, look at what is known at the moment about these questions of risks and harm. Uh, what's the latest evidence? What are the new studies um, on, say, the climactic impacts of uh, a, a limited nuclear exchange between a couple of countries and, you know, evidence about how this can uh, cause global cooling and affect the global food supply, even if there is a limited nuclear war uh, between some countries. So the point was to sort of make these the important facts about nuclear weapons which were being considered. Um, in terms of what the consequences are, of course, uh, nuclear weapons are the most destructive technologies uh, that have ever been invented, and um, you know, as well as the sort of massive blast, heat, and fire effects from their initial detonation, uh, the radiation uh, released can affect human health, uh, that of plants and animals, and the ecosystem for the extremely long term. Um, we've seen effects of, you know, health effects which are intergenerational, and uh, yes, sort of last for you know, many decades after nuclear weapons use and testing. Uh, there would be catastrophic impacts for the climate, as I mentioned, um, and 
importantly, for this initiative, uh, these would kind of disproportionately, um, they wouldn't only affect uh, countries who have nuclear weapons and their allies who might be subject to, to an actual nuclear explosion, but the um, effects would go across borders and potentially be global uh, in, their, in their impacts. And uh, in the you know, sort of conversation internationally and debate about nuclear weapons, often the focus has been on the interests of the nuclear armed states and those that are under their kind of nuclear defense arrangements, um, as if you know, the rest of the world doesn't have any kind of say in this, right? Uh, but in fact, the impacts of any kind of nuclear use um, but also the broader global security environment, you know, is important to all countries, right? Um, this is a picture of a bird on a Pacific island of, of Kiribati where there was a British nuclear testing, um, which, yeah, damaged a lot of wildlife there and also is, is kind of cute. So, um, at the end of this series of uh, conferences on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons, um, Austria issued this document called the Humanitarian Pledge which um, over 100 states signed on to with the intention of stigmatizing, prohibiting, and eliminating nuclear weapons. So the attention of the humanitarian initiative all along was to try and push towards this possibility of a new uh, treaty on these weapons, uh, but that wasn't being explicitly said at the time. Uh, this is kind of the first, first moment where it uh, gets kind of on the table explicitly. Political will was building during this time for the possibility of, of a new prohibition treaty. Um, there was this process mandated by the General Assembly for an open-ended working group to uh, recommend ways forward for multilateral disarmament, uh, one of whose recommendations was, uh, was this new treaty. And um, at the end of 2016, in the General Assembly session there, uh, we got a mandate uh, for negotiations on a treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons to lead towards their total elimination with about four weeks of time in 2017. Um, this is a picture from the open-ended working group uh, in 2016. Um, I always, um, this was a moment of extremely high diplomatic drama, but which like, doesn't sound very dramatic to, to anyone else, so I'll try on you guys, right? So um, this was the end of uh, four weeks of time looking at um, you know, what should be the ways forward on nuclear disarmament. There was a kind of broad group of states who were, you know, proposing the ban treaty, and then there were, the nuclear armed states boycotted these meetings, but their, um, like, sort of NATO and nuclear umbrella allies were there making the argument for a progressive approach, which is of, you know, kind of the normal steps that are, have been proposed for decades of ways forward to get towards nuclear disarmament, entry into force of the Comprehensive Death Pan Treaty, of his Armed Material Cut-Off Treaty and the Conference on Disarmament, some other, some other stuff. Um, and so this was trying to generate a consensus report, which all states could agree on with recommendations in. Um, the chair tried very hard to do this, and by Friday night, we had a document which had kind of slightly watered down the ban treaty recommendations, but like had what the other side of, you know, minority of states wanted, and it was about to go through. But then the time difference meant that um, Australia got instructions at like five to six to veto the report. So it couldn't pass by a consensus. And the um, UN Interpreters Union, you know, have a very strong union, so they don't work overtime. So the interpreters had to go home. We all had to go downstairs and uh, continue votes on this report, uh, which meant that countries had to physically put their hand up about what they wanted and make their intentions sort of, you know, super clear of their commitment on this ban treaty initiative or not. Um, rather than vote on the electronic voting machine up in, up in the other room. So, yes, yeah, so it was really exciting, and I can see on your faces you totally understand why. Uh, it ended up being a stronger report as, as a result, and uh, this went through, and resulted in this uh, General Assembly mandate for the um, treaty negotiations. So, um, all along with this, <coughs> ICANN has been advocating for this treaty to be negotiated um, with or without the participation of the nuclear armed states. And at Article 36, we did quite a lot of the sort of conceptual work here, uh, developing the argument of why this made any sense uh, whatsoever. Uh, the logic here is to do with building stigma and taboo and about delegitimizing nuclear weapons possession in order to kind of influence uh, states' attitude and behavior towards these weapons in the direction of you know, greater pressure for disarmament. Um, it's also a logic about what we can do, right? So when this st strategy was first being discussed, 
we can't physically take away uh, the nuclear weapons from nuclear armed states as a sort of you know, people who are concerned with this thing. Uh, we can just ask really nicely. Uh, but what we can actually do is we can take steps to, you know, take away the legitimacy uh, of these technologies, to, to erode these, to kind of, you know, build these steps of, um, which make greater taboos against nuclear weapons. Uh, a treaty prohibiting nuclear weapons and creating this legal framework signed by the majority of the world's countries it can help to chip away at the acceptance of the role of weapons of mass destruction in international relations, um, increase the sort of political costs for states that are associated with these weapons, and by this way, help to generate change, is our idea. And also provides a legal framework uh, for a path forward. So maybe, maybe this sounds unrealistic, that we can uh, dismantle these sort of you know, power structures by something kind of intangible, like stigma, um, but this approach, you know, in sort of our opinion, a key way and a key part of how we marginalize and get rid of weapons that kill indiscriminately uh, is through these legal measures of prohibition treaties. Um, ICANN was kind of trying to draw these parallels between other previously banned weapons and why aren't nuclear weapons yet on this list. Um, with the other weapons of mass destruction, um, you know, these were once seen as... Uh, sort of strategically or militarily useful by a lot of states, uh, and now generally only as abhorrent and horrific. Obviously, not all use has been eliminated, and international law uh, generally you know, relies on ultimately the consent of states. Uh, but for example, um, I found this thing in the archives once of, in the 1980s, uh, the Thatcher government in the UK was uh, considering proposing to NATO that it should um, adopt a, a chemical weapons deterrent as part of its like broader deterrent strategy. Um, that's not something that you can really imagine happening today. It would be a little bit unacceptable, not only you know, partly because uh, the UK is part of the Chemical Weapons Convention, but also because chemical weapons have been sort of so thoroughly stigmatized. Um, and in you know, the case of other weapons, like anti-personnel landmines and cluster munitions I mentioned, um, these treaties, which are listed here, uh, were negotiated sort of by states that were, were willing to do so, rather than um, including you know, every, every country and trying to reach a consensus on this, um, in order to take some positive step which could have an impact, even if the whole world was not involved. And there's been kind of clear humanitarian benefits from these prohibitions. Uh, from you know, the countries that, that did get involved and from setting these high international standards that have influenced the behavior of others. Um, in terms of sort of lessons from previous experience, um, I mean, we think it is you know, possible to transform the strategic and military role that different weapons occupy. Uh, obviously, you know, as I was saying, with uh, other weapons of mass destruction, uh, not all use has been eliminated, but their kind of importance and role has waned significantly uh, for most sort of countries who consider themselves powerful. Um, and with the landmines and cluster bombs experience, we saw that um, you know, the role and the kind of value that states ascribe to nuclear weapons, uh, sorry, to these weapons changed between the start and the end of the process. So at the beginning, many countries, including the UK, for example, were making strong arguments about uh, why uh, cluster munitions were essential to their arsenals um, and that you know, they couldn't possibly be uh, given up as a result. And by the end of the process, um, you know, these countries were accepting that a humanitarian prohibition uh, was the way forward and uh, also kind of you know, having a bit of amnesia about the previous arguments they were making about how important these, these weapons are. And there's a narrative around these treaties now that landmines and cluster bombs could be prohibited because they were sort of on the way out anyway and states weren't finding them you know, quite so useful, which is really belied by what happened at the time. Um, the mobilizing idea here is that we don't need to wait for those who value indiscriminate weapons to feel ready to prohibit and eliminate them. Um, that's unlikely to happen anytime soon. Why would countries get rid of something that they value? Uh, so we need to demand change by this process of building stigma and taboo against these weapons. Um, and ICANN has a lot of memes, right? And uh, this one is drawing a jokey parallel between banning smoking in you know, public places and banning nukes. You, don't, you, know, you can ban smoking uh, in bars, such as in the UK, before smokers are ready all to quit. 
And also you can ban nukes before we're ready to quit nukes. Uh, so we've seen this sort of dynamic work in some ways with, say, the anti-personnel landmines issue. Even though many states are um, outside of this treaty, um, some are still sort of in de facto compliance with it or sort of support its aims. Uh, the US, for example, once a major user, is now sort of one of the biggest donors to the humanitarian uh, mine clearance section, even though it hasn't joined and reserves the right to use these weapons in certain circumstances. Uh, and we've seen, for example, a lot of uh, companies stopping the manufacture of cluster munitions, even if the country they're based in is not part of the treaty, because of the financial pressure that has come on their financing um, as a result of you know, this new prohibition treaty and uh, institutions divesting. Obviously, nuclear weapons are different in their significance to global power dynamics and stuff, um, but this is the dynamic that ICANN is trying to go after. And um, I like wheeling out this quote because it shows that some states, you know, understand that they can be susceptible to this and that it can work, this kind of, you know, discursive strategy. So this is a quote from some uh, correspondence internally to the uh, UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office, which a colleague obtained via a Freedom of Information request. Uh, they're deliberating whether to come to this uh, meeting on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons in Oslo. Um, and, it's, and I think you know, it shows a good understanding of this approach and also you know, the potential dangers and pressures of it uh, for a government uh, like that of the UK. So it says, at the heart of the humanitarian disarmament movement, which is us, is the thread that any weapons which are indiscriminate in their effect should be outlawed. This is how the Convention on Cluster Munitions campaign began, which was very challenging to the UK at the time. The Oslo meeting will seek to establish as gospel that nuclear weapons have such an indiscriminate effect and must therefore be banned. So we need to establish a strong counter-narrative which reflects our broader disarmament and deterrence strategy. So they knew sort of our approach and that, um, you know, this was one about kind of changing the discourses and making change in this way and that it would be possible that they would have to do something as a result and it might be a little bit hard to win in the end. Um, so that's a quick rundown of this humanitarian approach to sort of reframe the debate on nuclear weapons to create change where it was going and its sort of logic. Um, in terms of civil society's role in this process, so as I suppose three main things that I talk about uh, within ICANN and outside, um, civil society with sort of, you know, the expertise of different NGOs working from different perspectives, um, you know, uh, scientists, doctors, uh, climate scientists, um, health professionals, uh, humanitarian agencies, things like this, uh, can all sort of bring an expert perspective uh, on these questions of sort of risk and harm. So um, a lot of organizations with within ICANN and outside were producing these kind of expert studies um, about you know, what is known about nuclear weapons and, uh, and their risks. Um, also sort of making the kind of political argumentation. So I mentioned that um, my organization did some work on this. This is one of our publications, a treaty banning nuclear weapons, which sets out the argument of you know, why this is a strategy that could make some difference. Um, as this kind of you know, momentum built on this process um, and you know, around this strategy uh, within ICANN and in our own organization, we did a lot of work sort of advocating and working with states to uh, build confidence in the idea of, of doing this treaty and that this strategy could have some impact on the global multilateral disarmament landscape. So the main people that sort of we work with in our work is um, individuals working at uh, missions to the UN in New York and Geneva who have the disarmament file. So they might cover a lot of other things, um, but they specifically cover disarmament issues. Uh, these are the people who um, you know, will be at negotiations, uh, doing stuff with the text, uh, and also who often have kind of some influence over their government's position on these issues uh, with you know, their kind of expert position and slight freedom of movement that they have. Uh, so it's sort of very important for us to um, you know, work well with them uh, if we're going to you know, try and achieve our collective objectives together. Um, ICANN you know, hasn't had a large public profile, uh, especially before you know, 2017. And one of the reasons for this was where we're specifically focusing our work is in this international diplomatic space. 
So um, with these state contacts and with kind of trying to change the conversations uh, in, in those spaces. This will kind of, you know, pivot increasingly uh, over the, you know, next years and stuff. Uh, something that Article 36, my organization did uh, specifically was to, um, and a role that kind of we take in some of these processes is in policy development, but also sort of convening informal uh, strategic kind of discussions with some of the key like ally states that we work with to um, build up these you know, ideas of what are the key strategic political issues, build confidence in the strategies and move stuff forward. Um, so this is a picture of a, a pub in England uh, where we had uh, this series of meetings um, to you know, convene these individuals and uh, talk about the, the ban treaty and how we were going to kind of achieve certain things, uh, which was you know, quite, quite important to uh, developing the core group of states that were working on this and their confidence in, in these uh, issues. So that's another uh, role that civil society takes. Um, at the actual negotiations, so this is a vain picture of me giving a statement at the UN. Um, so when we knew the treaty was on and this was happening, you know, we had four weeks uh, of negotiation time. Uh, we knew pretty much that there was going to be a treaty prohibiting nuclear weapons agreed by uh, these states who turned up. And um, our priority as a coalition then is to try and make sure that the text of the treaty is um, as strong as possible, that there's all the obligations in there that we sort of want to see, and that there's no sort of you know, slippage from this underlying kind of humanitarian principles which the treaty is based on. So um, within the sort of the rules of procedure of this negotiation conference, which was um, <coughs> under the General Assembly, uh, we were allowed to be in the room uh, most of the time, um, apart from when there was informal sessions, uh, we could submit working papers, we could like, just generally give out stuff to people and, uh, and meet them. Uh, we could also make statements at like, specific points in the session. Uh, we could um, convene lunchtime side events to talk about you know, particular issues where we uh, wanted to see kind of changes or uh, encourage certain positions from countries. Uh, and when we were outside of the room, of course, we could uh, communicate with people on WhatsApp. Uh, so we were doing a lot of this uh, for four weeks. Um, Looking at kind of, ICANN had this structure of both sort of thematic and regional coordination. Uh, so we had different teams covering uh, different regions of the world to make sure every state was adequately lobbied with our points. Uh, and also on our like specific issues where we wanted to see something in the treaty, uh, we had sort of thematic teams on those. So um, I, was, I was working coordinating this team uh, which was working on getting some obligations in the treaty text, uh, uh, which we called the positive obligations. So these were sort of following the model of previous treaties um, in humanitarian disarmament to have obligations to assist existing victims um, of nuclear weapons and also to remediate uh, contaminated lands and environments. So we wanted to see a standard maintained whereby there was a response to basically these you know, humanitarian issues that we were highlighting and talking about. Um, so we, we did a lot of work there, um, which ended up being articles six and seven in the treaty that oblige states to um, assist individuals affected by these weapons, to remediate aff affected environments to the extent possible, and also to assist each other within the framework of the treaty uh, to do this. Um, so the treaty negotiated in 2017, um, indeed it did so uh, without the participation of any of the nuclear armed states, uh, as we had expected. And uh, only one country from uh, any nuclear defense arrangement uh, joined, which was the Netherlands. Uh, and this, again, was because of the civil society pressure. So one of ICANN's organization um, called PAX, which is a big peace organization in the Netherlands, uh, did a large public petition to get this debated in parliament, um, you know, whether the government should join uh, the treaty negotiations or not. Uh, Parliament voted a resolution uh, saying that the you know, foreign ministry should go, uh, and then the foreign ministry has no option but to go. So the Netherlands were there, being as constructive as possible as they could within the circumstances, and then occasionally making a statement of how you know, they didn't actually want to ban nuclear weapons, so they were going to be voting against this treaty at the end, which is what happened. Um, so <clears throat> what has gone in this treaty? Obviously, it categorically prohibits nuclear weapons to all states uh, that join it, and assistance with prohibited acts, which um, we will be you know, campaigning to mean 
also uh, you know, restricting the financing of uh, nuclear weapons production through private companies. Uh, it provides this framework for the elimination of nuclear weapons. So um, it sets out you know, an option by which nuclear armed states can join this treaty and uh, destroy their stockpiles. It recognizes the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons, uh, the contribution of survivors, uh, and also the gendered impacts of nuclear weapons. Um, it requires this assistance of victims and environmental remediation. And it also mandates sort of regular review of the treaty, so meetings of states parties every couple of years, which means you know, within this, even without the nuclear armed states, uh, the countries that join it have things that they have to be doing to keep this active and alive. Right? Um, so, as I said, it was in anticipated and kind of fine that the nuclear armed states uh, didn't turn up to these negotiations initially, uh, but now it's very important sort of what happens next with this whole process. So, to achieve the goals, you know, set out for this treaty that I was talking about of bringing this, you know, normative pressure on the possession of nuclear weapons, you know, building this stigma and taboo and therefore pushing countries towards uh, disarmament. Um, the first thing that we need to do is achieve entry into force of the treaty, uh, which requires 50 countries to <coughs> deposit their ratification instrument for it. Uh, we currently have uh, 23. It's ICANN's sort of major work to try and uh, get this done by next year by encouraging states to do this. Um, lots of countries are getting a lot of pressure not to ratify the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons from uh, certain countries in particular. Um, <clears throat> they also got a lot of pressure not to participate in the negotiations uh, and not to vote in favor of the treaty. So really, I mean, I'm kind of quite impressed that 130 states turned up to this negotiation conference, 122 adopted it, and that we already have kind of 70 signatories. Um, yeah, there's some kind of colonial dynamics going on there as well. Uh, so at the moment, yes, we have 23 ratifications, 70 signatories. Uh, the pace of ratification, despite these factors, is kind of similar to other treaties at the moment. Um, the reason that you know, ICANN has a role in trying to get this done and not just leaving it to countries is that you know, whether a country is deciding to ratify a treaty depends a lot on you know, the time it has nationally and its national priorities. You know, th this process in, in most countries will involve some process of going through parliament and different levels of approval to um, you know, uh, adopt, adopt the ratification of a treaty, and they might have kind of other, other more pressing things to do, right? So it's our, um, our job to, to keep uh, the pressure up on that. After entry into force, this means that this treaty will be binding on um, all these states that have joined it, and they have to start doing work on the obligations that are contained within it, including these regular meetings of, of review of what's going on, um, and also ensuring that them as states and also their citizens and corporations in their territories, uh, in their jurisdiction or control, are compliant with the obligations of the treaty. They also have an obligation to encourage others to join um, and you know, start to take these steps on looking at what is still needed in terms of assisting affected people and remediating uh, contaminated environments uh, from past use and testing. So the significance of this treaty during this, you know, following kind of a long time in which there's not been very much movement in multilateral disarmament, it will be on keeping the focus on these issues and the underlying concerns which inform the ban treaty, developing this sort of normative pressure and stigma around nuclear weapons, and as well as providing this actual framework for, for elimination for, by countries if they wish to use it. Um, just briefly on the sort of you know, the rest of the current multilateral nuclear disarmament context that this treaty sits within. Um, I mean, there's this general global commitment uh, to a world free of nuclear weapons, which has existed since the you know, first resolutions of the UN and, and this thing. Um, there's kind of a range of proposals which uh, continues to exist, um, but a lack of action on them um, amongst nuclear armed states and their allies in particular. So um, kind of approaches uh, centered around the nuclear non-proliferation treaty and commitments made where you know bear within for the conclusion of further treaties which would gradually kind of you know restrict states actions in relation to nuclear weapons um, commitments by nuclear armed states to reduce the the role of uh, nuclear weapons in their kind of doctrines and strategic concepts 
those kind of things. Um, and other sort of phase step proposals, including uh, there's a work that a group of countries are doing, uh, for example, on verification that's been going on the past few years, to have these kind of you know, technical resources available uh, when they're needed. And proposals like um, India makes every year to the UN General Assembly for a new treaty uh, prohibiting use. Um, but basically, these are kind of generally just repeated without very much uh, going on. There's a lot of challenges to existing agreements at the moment as well, um, which you know I'm sure you see in the news and don't have to go into too much detail about. But uh, the Iran detail, uh, the Iran deal, and um, the US's withdrawal from that the pending withdrawal of the US from the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty with Russia, um, and also with the Non-Proliferation Treaty, this sort of growing disconsent at the uh, fact that not much has happened within this framework on disarmament for 70 years, um, and even you know countries like the US at the moment is sort of saying things in international forums, rolling back even from these proposals that they always make every year of what should be the next steps on nuclear disarmament. So, you know, the bar is getting quite low. And um, there's also the context of all nuclear weapons, nuclear armed states uh, undertaking modernization programs at the moment, uh, which a lot of which involves sort of qualitative improvements in their capabilities, um, increasingly kind of dangerous doctrines from um, <clears throat> the US and Russia in particular about having more usable nuclear weapons and a sort of regional tensions and stuff. Um, in terms of the reception so far in the nuclear armed and defense arrangement com uh, countries, obviously there's been um, a lot of governmental opposition, uh, the boycott, and also um, various critiques of the treaty and uh, the process that led up to it, uh, many of which are um, slightly spurious. Uh, but there's also, um, and we can discuss that in the discussion if you like, uh, there's also going on um, a lot of work nationally, um, such as with parliamentary inquiries in a few different countries, looking at um, this treaty and its implications and whether these countries should join. Uh, commitments have been made by political parties, um, so by the Australian Labour Party recently, to join this treaty, given certain conditions, um, when it's next in government. And also in Spain, where the Podemos Party made a deal with the coalition, um, with, you know, with, with potential partners there, uh, that joining this treaty uh, would be part of a program. Um, there's been resolutions by a number of cities around the world supporting uh, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, including Washington DC and also Canberra, and then a few other cities around the world as well. And we've also seen already some financial institutions and others uh, divesting from nuclear weapons producing companies. So for example, the government of Norway's uh, pension fund has um, excluded all these companies now based on the fact that there is this new treaty um, and other kind of banks and financial institutions have been tightening their policies as well. Um, so ICANN will be concentrating on sort of maximizing these kinds of pressures as well and building momentum towards the ratification of the treaty. Um, and just to mention it one last time, uh, for working to get our message out, the Nobel Peace Prize is an important tool, right? So um, this is Setsuko Furlo, who's a survivor of the atomic bombings, uh, um, the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. The moment she found out, and this is like, I love this picture. Um, she went and um, received the prize on our behalf uh, with Beatrice Finn, who is ICANN's executive director of the staff team. Um, they're collecting it uh, jointly here. And they both gave uh, fantastic lectures to this ceremony for the Peace Prize, which I recommend you um, listen to if you're interested in this subject area. Uh, winning this prize uh, for this work, obviously it's a great honor for ICANN, uh, but it's also extremely useful. So it gives us more of a chance to kind of profile our work and um, you know, the treaty in particular, and it gives this sort of mainstream recognition of what we're trying to achieve in order to stigmatize, prohibit, and eliminate nuclear weapons. So it makes us more of you know, a necessary voice in this debate, rather than just you know, some random people who are like into peace and are hippies and you know, that kind of thing. Obviously, we're that as well. Um, and you know, we'll try and use it to the full in that way. It was part of the rationale of the Norwegian Nobel Committee to give us the prize for this reason. You know, not because everything has been achieved on nuclear disarmament, uh, but because you know this this strategy and this new development needs needs more attention and needs to kind of make an impact. 
So we'll continue to try and you know, use this to the full uh, to help us try and change the discourse on nuclear weapons, not only amongst the certain states where this process has been happening so far at the international level, uh, but also in the public sphere, in our national politics, um, and also in our uh, local communities. Uh, so I'll leave it there. And thanks again very much for having me. this semester the students have learned a lot and uh, on this uh, topic uh, maybe I'd like to kickstart a small discussion uh, with students. Uh, Elizabeth you, you had a phrase a very important phrase in one of the slides regional tensions. Now those seem to be primarily the source for uh, nuclear weaponization uh, for countries wanting to acquire and build an arsenal, there are only two reasons. One is regional tensions with neighbors or with balance of power kind of logic in their respective regions. And the other is, of course, great power ambitions and the notion that possessing these weapons brings <coughs> prestige. And for example, people often say all the P5 members of the Security Council have nuclear weapons. So, to be accepted as a great power, this is like the ultimate, you know, um, deterrent or the weapon, and we must have it. Otherwise, we cannot become great power. So these two, uh, in what ways has I can try to challenge these arguments? Uh, you know, because I'm thinking of, you know, in the most potential two regions where there is likely to be more proliferation. One is Northeast Asia, given the North Korea situation, the South Koreans, and even the Japanese. You know, some. Uh, hard, far right in the Japan, even Japan are talking about, you know, ultimately we can't rely on Trump and we need to get our own nuclear weapons uh, to, to, to balance out uh, uh, North Korea. And the other, of course, is uh, the Iran, and our center down Iran, because the Saudi Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman has uh, publicly said that we are ready for nuclear weapons if the Iranians are allowed to get theirs. So regional tensions and the great power aspirate seem to be <coughs> primary reasons why any country would want to develop a nuclear program. So going forward, I mean, prohibition, we are trying to bring down to zero on one hand, disarmament, but on the other hand, the danger is actually from, you know, nine now? Uh, no, is it eight or nine? Nine, we have nine nuclear weapon states already. It could very well become 13 or 14 if these regional tensions <coughs> And these great power logic, you know, are not uh, changed. So while you are being focused on the getting the treaty and more narrowly on the mm, on the uh, on, on the ban and the prohibition uh, and disarmament, I mean, how how are how is I can try to counter the arguments these two in particular, which seem to be the logic behind which. States always say that you know we need to have these. Otherwise, you know uh, our regions are we are being threatened by neighbors, or otherwise we cannot become a great power. So what has been the um, you know it, it, to me it such a sensible that it has to be nested in a wider uh, peace movement uh, rather than simply focusing on the narrow question of nuclear weapons because nuclear weapons seem to be more a symptom of these problems like regional tensions and great power aspiration rather than an end in itself. Because most countries, and related to that, my question is, you know, the humanitarian aspect which you have been highlighting. I mean, the defenders of nuclear weapons would say, well, these are just for show. We never use them. 
these are mainly a way, these are you know, political um, instruments for us to get more power. And frankly, nobody ever is going to use them. And the last time it was used was uh, 75 years ago. So how would you respond to those, those kinds of things? <coughs> Yeah, thank you. And yeah, really, really important questions. I mean, I suppose, you know, if I can um, underline this sort of whole underlying purpose uh, of our work, like through the Bank Treaty and this focus on humanitarian impacts and from, you know, talking about nuclear weapons in this way of um, looking at what do they actually do and what are the risks of use and that kind of thing, is to try and, um, you know, undermine and call into question these logics about you know, that nuclear weapons are, <clears throat> are a symbol of power, that they're something that is needed for this you know, strategic balance, and take them more into an area where they're considered as <coughs> these are things that are just too risky and too unacceptable. So it's about creating that kind of broader change in what's the <coughs> dominant discourse about them in order to change the political dynamics. So, I mean, obviously this is a, a quite a long-term thing, right? This isn't going to have an immediate impact on um, what's going on right now in the Korean Peninsula for you know, between Iran and Saudi Arabia, and, but it's about creating this sort of, you know, global environment about how, how these things are considered in the uh, longer term by, you know, changing how nuclear weapons are valued by challenging their legitimacy in this sort of fundamental way. Um, you're right that, you know, focusing on nuclear weapons in particular, you know, we, we might be successful in doing this with nuclear weapons, and that won't take away the sort of you know, the broader way in which states relate to each other in this, you know, strategic stability, great power, like balance of power kind of way, and that something else could replace them. Um, I suppose this is a, you know, it's a challenge and it's a tension to all disarmament approaches of focusing on particular technologies at the, expo at the expense of sort of, you know, broader um, questions of international law and politics and things like that. Um, I suppose we, you know, tend to think that it's valuable enough to at least be trying to do this because of, say, the danger of nuclear weapons or the extreme humanitarian impact on anti-personal landmines or something like that. But, you know, it, it leaves certain things um, unaddressed for sure. Um, and this, you know, this idea of nuclear weapons is, is not being usable, right? That they, um, you know, they're just there as sort of a, a political thing and sort of a, you know, of this threat that, that which will never, will never definitely carry out. So, I mean, you see this in, um, I think all nuclear armed states kind of make this argument, right? So we, we acquired these weapons in order to never use them. So we, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, but I think that, you know, obviously they haven't been used in war. Uh, nuclear testing has still caused um, a lot of devastating impacts in the intervening decades. Um, but also it's sort of, I don't think it's, it's true that they're unusable. And not because of um, what countries think about how they behave, that you know, these are uh, something in this um, you know, logic of deterrence which is uh, very stable and everyone knows sort of what's going on and no one really wants to do this. Uh, but in this question of sort of you know, risks of inadvertent nuclear war or of accidental explosion and of things like this, where I think you know, this is one of the things that the humanitarian initiative concentrated on. Um, looking at um, you know, the evidence of the misses in the Cold War that I, I mentioned, um, there's a few sort of new studies on that, <coughs> showing of you know where either one single nuclear weapon almost exploded because of just you know some accident of dropping a bomb in some place um, and didn't quite go off. Um, there was a nuclear accident in Spain from the US like overflight and um, some uh, nukes there, which caused some <coughs> local contamination. Uh, there's cases of, for example, um, you know, a switchover in a shift uh, between um, you know, the guys monitoring other engine threats for missiles from Russia, uh, Soviet Union in the US at that time, um, and of a guy leaving in um, a training tape for an exercise um, to simulate the fact that um, the Soviet Union had uh, launched uh, a nuclear strike on the US, um, and therefore what's the protocol you go through in order to uh, launch nuclear weapons and do something. Uh, this was left in the machine, but you know, people are stupid, right? We all do stupid things sometimes. This guy almost caused a nuclear war. <laughs> there was a recent one like this, a false alarm over Hawaii. Uh, yeah, yeah. The North Koreans had launched an ICBM with nuclear yeah. gas. Yeah, yeah. So there's things like this that <coughs> happen all the time, right? where it could have, could have happened just by some accident. And also by like, the dynamics between states where, you know, 
I think, I mean, you guys probably know better, you see this between India and Pakistan, what's at the moment, sorry, of, but, you know, there's some escalation in conflict, um, and there's not, not necessarily a clear understanding of, you know, what's the nuclear red line, and uh, what are the different countries thinking about when they will be mobilizing different aspects of their strategy. It makes it very sort of risky and unstable. So, you know, theoretically, these weapons aren't for use, uh, but these kind of things um, mean that actually, you know, they're nearer to some use than so we shouldn't be thinking about them in this sort of you know magical way, uh, but of looking at like what what might the actual risks be. Yeah. Okay, do you have uh, any questions? This is a very fair opportunity where you can ask questions to the practitioners who are actually involved in the abuse processes. And Yeah. Well, yeah. um, it's actually <coughs> safe to say that a lot of patients usually justify the need to build like a political, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a nuclear base based on either like a self-defense perspective or like a political perspective of the need for power. How do you think um, the idea of violating certain principles or certain agreements between nations is actually acted upon because I mean, within, in my opinion, I think they have been left without a robust um, uh, act upon them. So do you think that is going to change um, in the foreseen future, or is that is something that nations always have a loophole to look at? Yeah, so I guess uh, the question, of, you know, is there, is there adequate penalties for um, countries if they violate them? Do do bad things in the international sphere. I mean, I suppose this is generally a problem of the limits of um, international law rights and uh, norms between states. Um, at a certain point, you can have kind of mechanisms of, of coercive sanctions and also of sort of social pressure and the stigma, which a lot of these humanitarian disarmament treaties uh, operate on. Um, but it's you know, in in many ways, it's always very fragile. And we've seen this with with the chemical weapons issue recently, for example. Like that was a very kind of strong treaty and framework uh, coming under challenge from abuse in Syria and the lack of sort of, you know, being able to really kind of get some hands on that. So, I mean, I suppose, like for me, me as a person, I don't have a, an answer for this. I think it's a very kind of thorny problem. Um, I suppose what we try to do as, you know, kind of activists and NGOs is to work as hard as possible to, you know, keep keep these norms as strong as possible, to be keeping doing work to you know, focus on the value of uh, these different uh, instruments of international law, uh, calling states out when they are you know, doing things to, to violate them, and uh, that being part of the you know, global environment of trying to I mean, encourage compliance. Um, I mean, it's something that our, my colleagues in the Landmines campaign do a lot, and uh, on the cost of munitions campaign, to you know, speak very strongly against any use of these weapons, uh, and it does, you know, sometimes have an impact on states uh, who are outside these treaties. Um, but yeah, it's a, you know, it's a fragile and, and difficult thing. So I don't have a full answer for you, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, two questions, if I may. Um, first, are they hard? sorry. Are they hard? <laughs> I don't know. Um, What's been the overall general reaction in the NPT sort of review meetings uh, and so on? Now that there's this new model, this new approach, are they, is that pushing them forward to shaking them out of their lethargy? Are they digging in their heels? So that's the first. Uh, secondly, um, in looking at the chemical weapons taboo, right, uh, which has taken a hit because of Syria. Um, I guess like it's not directly relevant, but how does that affect your perspective as you try to strengthen a nuclear weapons use taboo um, through your own work? <coughs> so yeah, yeah, good question. So firstly, um, in the NPT framework, so um, all along uh, with the Ban Treaty Initiative, there's been um, sort of a narrative from uh, countries that are um, you know, nuclear weapons states and their allies within the NPT 
that this new initiative could um, undermine the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty um, in, in some way. It's never quite specified how, to be honest, because it's a political argument um, to try and you know, delegitimise the delegitimising effort of, of the Man Treaty, essentially. Um, so there's been a sort of, you know, kind of spurious legal conversation about are these treaties in legal conflict? Uh, during the negotiation of the Prohibition Treaty, um, you know, the negotiators uh, worked very hard to make sure there was little, you know, compatibility in that any country that joined this new treaty would not um, be, you know, signing onto anything that was of a lower standard to what they already had, but it would be at least equal or a, or a higher standard. Um, so there's been this thing which, you know, in a way is um, a point of, of distraction to try and, um, you know, deflect from the actual issues we want to talk about of our nuclear weapons legitimate and onto this, like, you know, can we sort of do some legal analysis and spend a lot of time uh, on that. In terms of in the actual forums and discussion, so last year was the first preparatory committee of the NPT uh, when this, this treaty was here, um, and it was interesting to you know, be seeing what was happening there. Um, obviously, a lot of the countries which uh, supported the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons uh, spoke very strongly in favor of it in that forum, um, and as a measure which can help to fulfill the disarmament goals uh, of the NPT, so there was a very strong narrative there. Um, a lot of, uh, well, some of the nuclear arms states uh, took the opportunity to um, set up their positions as so-called persistent objectors to the new treaty. So to um, say basically that they'll never accept that this is something in customary international law, uh, that they'll never join the treaty, and they think that this is you know a dangerous and, and useless initiative. Um, the, the criticism we've had of the treaty has been sort of on two opposite poles, uh, to be honest, which is quite interesting. So on the one hand, this is pointless, like it doesn't add anything new, um, you know, this won't eliminate a single nuclear weapon, like what, why did we waste time doing this thing? And on the other hand, this is extremely, you know, destabilizing and dangerous and can have all these, you know, results to international law, to like the global apocalypse, to whatever. Um, so, you know, we have these, these kind of two, two tracks on which the nuclear arms states are trying to attack this thing, which I think in a way shows, um, shows something positive for the strategy. Um, so uh, last year we had, you know, again it was kind of two camps, pro and anti, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, and as always you see sort of more acknowledgement and value given to the position uh, which is against, because these countries are seen as the countries which are the, you know, militarily significant states or the, you know, more important global powers, and that the majority of the world, you know, even if it's the majority of the world, their opinion is not, you know, doesn't have as much agency or importance. Um, next week uh, is the next uh, preparatory committee meeting uh, in New York, um, and uh, I think what you know, what we're going to see there is a continuation of this kind of discussion and dynamic. And I think it's you know positive for the forum that there is there is this tension there of countries saying we've taken this step towards disarmament, and uh, you know what are you what are you going to do about it as, as nuclear armed states. Um, a lot of the nuclear arms states have also said that you know this was a bad initiative because it created polarisation in the global community. You know it kind of drew this line between those who are nuclear armed and those who don't like nuclear weapons, and that was a bad thing. And I think really you know that already existed, right? And it's existed for for 70 years. And sometimes you know disagreement and political tension can be something productive to develop change, right? And uh, it wasn't wasn't created by this initiative. Um, another thing that will be happening next week is um, the US has been uh, pursuing this thing called uh, creating the environment for nuclear disarmament, uh, which is basically a kind of very sort of broad initiative looking at what are the, what's the global environment needed in order for us to have disarmament. Um, and they're sort of having a working group on this, um, and it's basically discussing you know, what, what state of world peace will we need uh, before possible to do anything about nuclear weapons, um, rather than, you know, say, looking at things the other way around, of can we do something about nuclear weapons and that will contribute to a, a state of better, better peace and security between countries. Um, it's sort of a threat to this framework in a way because, like I was saying, it involves rolling back from previous disarmament commitments, which were already minimal, uh, but I think those will be two of the kind of main dynamics. Um, in terms of, yeah, and the chemical weapons one taking a hit. Uh, I mean, 
I guess, like I said, sort of with, with all these things, it's like a constant work to um, maintain norms and taboos and stigma and standards. And it's not like, you know, you do the treaty once and then, then it's done, right? Um, obviously, it's, you know, it's a difficult situation for, I mean, primarily for people who are affected by these acts, but, you know, for international law um, and for, you know, kind of a rules-based international system as a whole when, when these things happen. Um, because of, you know, yeah, that the nature of the international system depending on states essentially, you know, upholding things that they said they would. Um, at a certain point, it's, it's difficult to, to bring more pressure than, than you can have, uh, you already have politically and, and that kind of thing. Um, I suppose for, for us on nuclear weapons, I mean, given, like you were saying, with the sort of great power ascribed to these weapons and significance and value, um, that the idea persists, I mean, at the moment, because that's how they're seen, uh, that anyone or any country who has any nuclear weapons would essentially be, you know, would be the most powerful country in the world. So like if, if all nuclear armed states disarmed and then uh, someone got them again, that that country would basically be the, the most powerful, powerful one. Um, and that's sort of a reason why people see nuclear disarmament as a dangerous thing and sort of ultimately impossible because what if this happens and they come back and then you know, North Korea will the world or, or whatever. Um, I suppose with this, um, you know, we are aiming for, with, with this whole initiative, that um, nuclear weapons will no longer have those status in that, in that situation, right? So it will be more like, you know, with, with chemical weapons, where is it? Or with, you know, it's extremely dangerous for any country to have them. Um, but it's not kind of, that doesn't, Syria using chemical weapons has had no sort of strategic significance to Syria's role in the world in, in that kind of way, as we speak about with nuclear weapons. And that's, I suppose, what we're, what we're going for. Um, but on the other hand, you know, these, it, it is true that these kind of global systems of verification and control will be very important at that time, as well as just these social and political pressure aspects. I don't think they can get us, you know, all the way on, <laughs> on nuclear weapons themselves. Yeah. Okay, so I'll uh, break the protocol. Okay, I have to head out for an interview. So I'll request uh, <coughs> student volunteers to please uh, bring forward because I can honor Elizabeth and then slip out, but uh, the conversation could continue for yeah. some more time and Professor uh, Hanako can carry the forward. Yeah, good points. I mean, 
you know, the success of these kinds of initiatives, um, you know, does, does depend a bit on the kind of, you know, prevailing environment that exists outside, trying to change the environment on nuclear weapons in particular as well, right? Um, and, yeah, can we get there in the context of the current sorry, security architecture and how states are orienting and, and things like that? I mean, it's not... It's, it's not an easy environment to work on disarmament multilaterally at the moment, right? I mean, within our sort of community, and uh, say in ICANN and on, on this work, uh, we generally, you know, we sort of have, have the luxury of working with countries that share our objectives, right? So it's sort of, we do these things in close partnerships uh, with those that want to make these kind of changes, that are sort of, you know, understand these strategies and like, you know, want to do that stuff again. Um, but it is a challenge in the you know sort of fewer countries that our kind of core members are dropping off right with changes in governments and this like rise of general right wing populism in the world and this kind of thing, uh, which affects like our kind of political possibilities, uh, but also the question of like global NGO funding and you know the ability of organisations to to work on these issues. Um, and yeah, I guess just some side on that. I mean we an organisation. Um, like a partner organisation of ours, uh, which works on the issue of you know, civilian casualties from airstrikes in, in Syria and so their kind of whole year budget is the same as a uh, one precision guided music munition that has been used in the you know in the US in these bombings, right? So it's you know it's a crazy inequality we have <laughs> between um, you know I suppose the whole kind of edifice of state violence and power in the arms industry. And then us trying to be like, maybe this isn't such a good idea. So, I have all this, this thing. Um, so yeah, so I suppose I again don't have a don't have a great answer for you. I mean, it is it's a sort of very difficult time to be working on this. Uh, we try to find the routes that we can, and um, you know the kind of the stakeholders, uh, both in states and international organisations and civil society, that can help us to kind of move forward on these things and, and shift the environment on nuclear weapons. Um, and, and other weapons issues, and with nuclear weapons, I mean this this implicates the global security architecture much more than any of these, these other issues. Like you're saying, right? so in a way, this is a much kind of harder campaign and a harder sell to do. And uh, we might need to find sort of other ways of engaging um, outside of just you know, multilateral nuclear forums in order to try and take this forward. Um, so yeah. Any other questions? Lot. You've learned everything you need to know. <laughs> May I just ask you, well, I'm not really sure whether my questions are going to be relevant or not, but, but just a bit of, maybe a bit of counter argument to what the, uh, maybe the <coughs> dean said. Okay, the, uh, I am from the very country where what he calls the regional tensions is increasing. However, it doesn't mean to say that the population, I mean, the majority of the population starting to feel the need to neutralize the country, no way, because the, uh, it's to do with the education, and which is exactly why I think the uh, organization like uh, the, the ones uh, Elizabeth is working is really important because at the end of the day, it's about educating the population about the uh, reality of the nuclear weapon and uh, well, throughout the seven, throughout the, uh, the past seven decades, and that's exactly the country has been doing to the the, the entire population, and uh, so that sort of uh, view towards the uh, nuclear weapon is not going to change just like that. So under despite the circumstances, majority of the population is very much against the. Uh, idea of neutralizing the country, no way, as a matter of fact, and uh, I would say that if, say, for instance, the Prime Minister makes such a statement himself, that would be the end of his political life. Uh, and then, okay, the, um, some also the minor and uh, super-right politicians might have said something like that, sort of indicating that sort of thing, not necessarily we should sort of way, but uh, as a political leader, he's really aware that uh, he mustn't say such a thing because that would be the end of his political life. And uh, it's uh, totally against the, uh, uh, how the, 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 uh, the whole direction of Japanese diplomacy throughout the last uh, 
seven decades. And uh, as for the second point, great power aspiration, well, let's face it, there are many non-nuclear states that can be regarded as great powers. Um, say Germany, it's not a it's not a nuclear state, but uh, nobody would argue that it's a powerful state. And Japan, well, it's not a nuclear state, okay, it might be under the nuclear umbrella of the United States. However, um, the, um, this great power aspiration is not necessarily kind of uh, universally applicable. That is something I want to sort of uh, um, point out. Um, so again, I suppose it's to do with the um, education or spread the sort of, uh, say, appropriate information to the public. Mm -hmm. So um, as such, it's not even a question, but uh, yeah. And as such, the, uh, maybe you could do the same in Britain. <laughs> I hope because, you see, the, the thing is, when I was studying in Britain, one of the things that surprised me was that for you, I was watching the uh, TV program called Question Time, when, where people can ask questions the politician, and there was this one elderly guy who was criticizing the politician for decreasing military expenditure, and that was astonishing to me because, if anything, in Japan it's going to be the completely opposite. If the military expenditure goes up, people would criticize their government, as a matter of fact. So, that was kind of culture shock to me. So, that and uh, amid that, that sort of uh, atmosphere. You said that there are as many as four organizations working as part of ICANN. So I'm just hoping that the, uh, those organizations are going to be sort of driving force uh, in Britain. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Good luck to us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I suppose um, to sort of yeah, yeah. change the atmosphere and the, uh, the yeah, yeah. perception of the people, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like you're saying, and I suppose it fits into ICANN's broader ideas of you know, we've, we've got to change the prevailing discourse on nuclear weapons in different places, right? And some of that is, is the public, it's the national political cultures, as well as this international legal sort of sphere that we've been concentrating on. Um, in Britain, yes, there's like a sort of very deep acceptance of the idea of nuclear deterrence um, being, you know, sort of a valid thing, an important thing for the UK's security. Um, a lot of people sort of erroneously equate this with being part of the P5 of the Security Council. Just because of the coincidence of nuclear possessors, the UK isn't on the Security Council because of its nuclear weapons, right? That's nothing, nothing to do with the structures, as you all know. Um, but it's, it's what people think, and you know, even sort of, I don't know, say MPs that we talk to, and like people who should know these things think that that's, that's the case. Um, I think you, you probably would have seen when you were watching Question Time as well. I mean, um, at the time of, of one of the general elections, you know, nuclear weapons comes up as an issue because so there has been a very like strong anti-nuclear and peace movement in, yeah. in the UK, right? The campaign for nuclear disarmament, which was extremely active, uh, particularly uh, you know in the 80s, and um, sort of all these uh, you know the Green and Common protests, which achieved um, a lot of things like you know to do with. Um, <clears throat> these like intermediate range uh, nuclear missiles have had an influence on that debate. I mean, since since the Cold War, um, I think a lot of people in the UK uh, think that this problem has has gone away. Um, that because there's not that sort of superpower rivalry anymore, that we kind of just have nuclear weapons a little bit just for power and prestige, and um, you know that there's no kind of dangers there. Um, and so um, the, the current leader of the Labour Party, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, was a long-time member of CND mm -hmm. and has been sort of supportive of nuclear disarmament personally for a long time. So this came up in the election campaign mm -hmm. of um, you know this this uh, question of would you press the button? There isn't a natural button, by the way, but you know, it's a figurative button. Um, so in in the kind of uh, the last sort of vote in Parliament that the UK had on this issue to extend the life of our nuclear weapons program. One MP asked Theresa May, um, you know, would you would you be willing to launch a nuclear weapon which would immediately kill uh, you know hundreds of thousands of people? And then um, discriminate among them. And then, yeah, yeah. So this this question came up. She was very happy to stand up at the dispatch box, give a one word answer of yes, and sit down again. Um, <laughs> which is really, you know, sort of quite incredible. And she wouldn't say that in relation to any other thing. Of like you know, would you do a genocide? Yeah, don't you? Um, <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's not bad, but it's, 
Uh, but nuclear weapons have this have this status there. Um, um, and then so then there's the, the thing of um, it would Jeremy Corbyn press the button? Um, and uh, you know that this is a, a kind of qualification for being a UK prime minister who would be willing essentially to use nuclear weapons. Um, and that's you know that's where we where we are in the UK uh, debate really. So I think for, for us it's you know there will be a major work to uh, find ways to um, again you know challenge the legitimacy of this kind of um, orientation to these technologies uh, and whether this is something that you know Britain as a responsible state should really be you know be willing to do um, is this something that we you know really want to require of our military uh, often in these kind of campaigns we use organisations around why would you force you know good soldiers to use bad weapons um, and like this kind of thing uh, but at the moment the sort of discussion in the UK is very much stuck in, in the 80s and the fear of the 1980s and the fear of sort of being seen as weak if you uh, want to do anything on this, this question of nuclear disarmament. Uh, this was a massive digression on the UK, it may or may not have been interesting to you uh, but yeah basically I think it, there and in I think every nuclear arms state there's, there's a lot of those dynamics right and if we're going to kind of make progress we need to find ways to challenge them um, you know, without it being sort of purely seen as a, you know, just as a, as a peace movement thing, but as something that is based on, um, you know, the evidence about these weapons and how, um, you know, their impacts, their risks, how they might be used, what are the actual possibilities of that, and um, how is that kind of actually, you know, a threat and a danger to our societies and countries, rather than something that just, you know, gives us power and gives us strength. Any other things you might want to add or ask? <coughs> well, you see, this discriminatory nature of the uh, sorry, is the uh, most uh, is something differentiate the uh, nuclear weapons from other conventional weapons, and uh, and uh, in that respect, uh, it is obviously a war crime and. Uh, I have this sort of mixed fe I used to have this mixed feeling about the uh, ah how that did it. Ah, okay, my mother's from Hiroshima and that's such of course I'm confounding against the nuclear weapons in general. However, uh, if you think about the historical context and it, it was rather difficult for me to make a how that did it. A straightforward uh, judgmental assessment about this question that when I was attending the MSC, attending the, attending the lecture, just law theory or whatever, uh, the professor clearly declared that, that from this point, that from the, in this regard, the nuclear weapon is totally against the uh, law theory because uh, there's no such thing as proportionality and uh, the, uh, there's no such thing as this, uh, this discrimination as well. So the uh, um, that's another thing uh, that we should be aware of, that it's very different from uh, any other types of weapons, that the anyone can be targeted just like that. And uh, also another thing is that the people can be affected for generations, which indicates that it can be proportionate. And in know that how evil you are, the, uh, you can't be sort of uh, punished for generations, if you know what I mean. And uh, it seems to me that that's aspect is quite uh, very much uh, kind of uh, overlooked. Like for instance, what's the difference between the uh, Hiroshima and the uh, Coventry sort of argument? <laughs> Actually, there is a huge difference because the people are suffering for generations. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, these unique effects are definitely uh, something mm. about them. And again, something that we try to Which should be sort right? of uh, emphasized. Uh, yeah, yeah. I shouldn't be talking too much. <laughs> Is there any other questions? Are you sure? <laughs> okay. We talked for quite a long time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Elizabeth. So the, I learned a lot, and the, I've got so many other questions I want to ask, but maybe you can, yeah, I can ask later. Well, uh, thank you for organizing this diplomatic diplomatic really media. Thank you very much. I wanted to come anyway, but it was good that, to be part of it. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the next event, whatever it is going to be. Thank you. <laughs>